Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining my talk, Fuzzing Linux with Zen. My name is Tomasz Lengel, and I'm a senior security researcher at Intel. And I also maintain a variety of open source tools, such as the Zen hypervisor, libvmi, Druckwolf. And I also participate in the HoneyNet project, where we usually run Google Summer of Code projects during the summer, developing open source tools to fight against malware. Uh, what this talk is about is that we had this uh, task of fuzzing the device-facing input points of several Linux kernel modules, kernel drivers, and we had to build new tools to get it done. We open sourced them. Uh, we found a bunch of bugs and fixed them. I will talk about those. But really, the point of this talk is to show you how we did it so you can go out and do it yourself. Uh, to start, let's talk a little bit about feedback fuzzers. Uh, they are not just about feeding random input to your target. Uh, they use feedback as a mechanism to better uh, exercise your target code. And they do it by effectively collecting the execution log, or called the coverage, uh, when you are running the fuzzer. And you can use that to compare execution from run to run to determine if the fuzzer was able to discover some new code that hasn't been seen before. The idea is simply that if you've discovered some new code region that hasn't been exercised before, it's worthwhile to focus on that because the chances of finding some new bugs is higher on code that hasn't been exercised as much. Obviously, what feedback fuzzers need the most is determinism. If the target code behaves radically differently from one run to the other, then the fuzzer might just get stuck in uh, focusing on inputs that don't actually lead anywhere because it will think that it's opening up new code paths when it's in fact just noise. So if you have garbage in, you will have garbage out. So Zen VM forking is uh, supposed to address that shortcoming. It is effectively a way to add determinism to kernel code execution. If you think about the kernel, it's pretty undeterministic. You have interrupts firing all the time. You have multiple threads and scheduling. It's, you know, uh, as far away from deterministic execution as you can get. Um, so VM forking uh, allows you to split the runtime of a VM into multiple VMs and populate the memory of these fork VMs from the parent one. So to make this as fast as possible, uh, you effectively can just, when the v fork is executing a memory access where it's a read or an execution, you can just populate those page table entries in the fork with a shared page table entry. And you only have to actually deduplicate the entire page of memory if the fork is writing something into memory. To get even better speed, once you have a fork VM set up, you can actually just reset the state of that fork VM, uh, just copy the VCP registers from the parent and throw away any of the deduplicated copied pages, but keep the shared pages in place. That will get you the best performance. If we take a look at numbers, uh, if you run these operations in a tight loop, you can create about 1300 VMs per second. If you are doing a reset, that's about 9,000 resets per second. So these numbers are you know, fairly OK for, uh, for fuzzing. Obviously, you will not see these numbers um, because these are the theoretical max if you are doing nothing, just resetting the VM. Um, obviously, in between those resets, you actually want to run your target code. A couple other building blocks to mention here to really understand uh, what we will be doing is uh, most importantly, Zen's introspection subsystem. So this is what I've been working on for the last 10 years. Um, it allows you to really peek into the runtime execution state of a guest. You can read and write the memory, translate virtual addresses, but uh, it also allows you to pause the vCPU of, uh, of the VM at various hardware events and get a notification of uh, those hardware events in your res regular user space application in DOM0, which makes development of tools, introspection tools, really quite convenient. Um, you can get you know, notification for CPU IDs, breakpoints, single stepping, uh, EPT faults, and a bunch of other things. 
The other really cool feature that just got upstreamed into Zen is called VM Trace. Uh, we did this in collaboration with the Polish CERT and Citrix. And this is an effective way of turning on Intel processor trace to record the execution of a full VM from DAM0, where the CPU itself will store enough information about the execution of that VM in, with low overhead so that later on that log can be uh, decoded so to reconstruct the execution of that VM, see what happened. And obviously this is what we will be using to collect the coverage information. So if we look at the full flow of how the fuzzing setup is working on Zen, if we start from the parent VM, you boot up your regular VM, and when the target code is reached, you compile the target code with a magic CPU ID in place that will signal to the fuzzer that this is the point you want to start fuzzing. The fuzzer will find uh, you know, that CPU ID when it executed, will create a fork, which we call the sync VM, in that sync VM, we look up the virtual address of various kernel functions that usually uh, get called when something bad is about to happen in the kernel, such as a panic is happening, Kasan or Ubisan, uh, built-in error detection systems in the Linux kernel trip. We add a breakpoint to the entry of all of those functions, and we create another fork. This is what we call the fuzz VM. This is where we will actually be performing the fuzzing. Uh, the, this works effectively by taking the input that's generated by the fuzzer. Uh, in this case, we are using AFL, American Fuzzy Lab. We take the input that's generated by the fuzzer and we write it straight into the VM's memory. Unpause it, see what happens. If we catch a breakpoint, that's going to be you know, at one of those entry addresses that we breakpointed earlier. Great, we just found a you know, crash that we would report back to AFL. If we catch the magic CPU ID again, that would be the end harness. So you have a start harness and an end harness. If you hit the end harness, then you know nothing bad happened. If neither, then we report a timeout. Afterwards, we can take a look at the Intel processor trace log, decode it, and we use that to report the coverage back to AFL so that it will understand if something uh, new happened while fuzzing that VM. And then we just reset the state and go to the next input from, from AFL. Let's uh, take a look at the demo of how this actually looks in practice. I am creating an Ubuntu 20.04 VM, and I will be booting a Ubuntu uh, Linux 5.10 kernel that has the uh, harness already compiled into it. I'm booting with KSLR and PTI disabled just to make debugging easier later on. And what we will be fuzzing is a USB driver in that kernel. I effectively have a thumb drive USB stick attached to a USB 3 hub. And I fire up the KFX fuzzer to listen to when that magic CPU ID, which in here is called magic mark, is executed. So now it's just listening to see when that CPU ID happens. Uh, the VM finished booting, I will log in, and we'll initiate some interaction with that USB thumb, thumb drive that will trigger that, that harness I have pre-compiled in there. So I ran fdisk, and you see that fdisk never returned, it never finished, and that is because that VM is now paused because the KFX caught that CPU ID, and we have the information about where the target buffer and the target size is that we want to fuzz. We can go to that virtual address, read out that memory to be used as the seed for the fuzzer, right? So this is the normal execution would be that the kernel was just about to do while executing that fdisk. And we will start mutating from that structure to see you know, what can happen if, uh, if that uh, input is, is uh, malformed or malicious. We will be using the FL++ here, fuzzer is up and running. Uh, we are opening up a bunch of paths, as you can see. And in less than a minute, there is already a crash found. And we'll go into the details of what uh, this crash is about, but this is actually a real bug in the Linux kernel that was you know, discovered just like, just like that. So at this point, you're probably wondering, like, OK, what the hell did we just fuzz? and you know, what the bug is. 
And you're right, uh, there is more to fuzzing than just running the fuzzer. Um, in this engagement, we discovered that really the biggest pain point is not running the fuzzer. Once the fuzzer is up and running, it's great. You can you know, go and take, take a walk, grab a coffee. It's awesome. You don't really have much to do. It's all you know, automated. Uh, the real pain point is performing the analysis, figuring out what to fuzz in the first place. And then once the fuzzer finds something, uh, getting enough information out about the crash so that you, know, you can create a report or fix the bug. So how do we do all of those steps? So let's, let's start at analysis. Um, what we were fuzzing there is DMA. And DMA is memory that the kernel makes accessible to an external device. Uh, and this is to facilitate fast IO operations. Shared memory, you have <clears throat> better speed. And the way this works is that the device has direct access right, uh, to that memory so that it doesn't have to go through the CPU and the MMU to actually uh, read or write to that memory. Uh, there is what's called the IOMMU, but usually the IOMMU restricts access to other pages. Pages that are explicitly made accessible by the kernel to the device will be allowed to be accessed by the device through the IOMMU. So the IOMMU is not going to protect you against you know, a malicious device that is placing random stuff on the DMA page that it's allowed to, to do. Um, so we figured, okay, let's take a look at the Linux source code, see where DMA memory is getting accessed. Um, it should not be too bad, right? Like when you have a system call, what the kernel is doing, uh, when it receives some buffer from user space, the first thing it does, it copies it into kernel memory and you know, does its processing there. So we figured, well, that's how DMA works as well. Um, the kernel should copy the DMA memory first to an internal buffer and uh, go from there. Uh, but boy, were we wrong. Uh, it turns out that the kernel is accessing DMA memory all over the place. There is no single function that you know, copy from DMA. Um, once DMA memory is established, the kernel can access that and does access it all over the place. So even just figuring out where Linux reads from DMA is not trivial. So what we did was we looked through the source code looking for you know, hints of when the kernel might be doing a DMA read. And it's quite painful because you know, just by looking at the source code, you don't necessarily know whether some pointer is a DMA uh, memory or not. Uh, so we, what we did, we looked for the IOMM cookie, or the best one was actually to look at the NDNS conversion functions that go, you know, big NDN, little NDN to CPU. That is a pretty clear indication that, you know, the memory that is being, or the data that is being read might not be in the right NDN format that the CPU expects. So that usually means that there was some cross-communication with an external device. Um, and then take the output from ftrace, which is a built-in, subsystem in Linux that allows you to trace the execution of the kernel internally. Cross-reference you know, what we found that you know, we think is DMA access and see that better those functions actually get called during execution of the kernel, right? Because we found a bunch of these accesses, but they, those were functions that never actually executed during runtime. And those are not really good targets to fuzz because if you can't get the code to execute, then you can fuzz it. So uh, this was... <clears throat> not great. Uh, so we also decided to just, you know, be old school and dig through the spec. Uh, maybe, you know, we get a better understanding of, you know, what's going on here because the kernel code is not the easiest thing to read. Um, so looking at the spec itself, it, we can find pictures like this that are immensely helpful to, you know, try to understand what the hell is going on. Obviously, this subsystem, as you can see, is quite complex. Um, but really, the biggest boost that we got for uh, our engagement here was to just discover what the name of the rings are that the subsystem uses for you know device to kernel communication and these are the event ring transfer rings and the command ring so just knowing those names we were able to just you know grab whether there is a variable called event ring and see you know where that is being accessed <clears throat> so what we found is um, this location where yeah there is what's called the event ring and this is a function that gets called from the interrupt handler. 
Um, obviously, what happens is that the device or the USB hub is placing some data on this ring and sends an interrupt, and then the kernel goes and processes whatever you know, structure that the device has sent, and it decues that from that ring page, which is DMA accessible. So what we just fuzzed, what the harness setup was, is just after that you know, structure is decued from the DMA page, uh, we have the harness start, and we transfer information about where that pointer is and what the size of the structure is. And then we have a couple points that we want to stop uh, the fuzzer and go to the next iteration. Effectively, whenever this function would return, we want to stop the fuzzer. We want to you know, fuzz everything that's in this function and whatever this function calls. Um, as for what those harness functions actually look like, they are really just the CPU ID instruction where we stuff you know, the magic information into, into registers that the user space tool in DOM0 that can receive so these are effectively, you can think of them as hyper calls. All right. So but once we found that bug, you know, what's the next step? Um, with VM forks are a little special on, on Zen in that they are not fully functional VMs. You can turn them into fully functional VMs, but for fuzzing, it's obviously there's no point. Um, but because of that, there is, you know, a little bit of uh, pain in actually figuring out um, what happened in them because you don't get to just log in and gather the logs because there's no network, there's no disk, no console, there's no IO into VM forks. They are literally just running with CPU and memory. But fortunately, the D message buffer that the Linux kernel uses to store information about runtime events and you know, errors and whatnot is just sitting in RAM. So we can go and carve it out. The way we do that is we're gonna use GDBSX uh, that's been shipping with Zen for over a decade at this point. And it's really just the minimal GDB bridge. Uh, if you build the kernel with debug information and frame pointers, <clears throat> you can access the information uh, of the kernel state using just GDB. So let's uh, take a look at how this works. So this is where we were. We just found the bug. Uh, we want to figure out you know, what happened, what, what is the bug. So we'll take KFX, we'll re-execute, but instead of taking the input from AFL, we'll just you know, use that file that was found by AFL. We'll inject it into a VM fork and see what happened with the debug output. We see that, okay, UBSON prolog tripped. So UBSON prolog is the function that gets called when the kernel starts to construct the UBSON report. So we want to stop the VM fork after it actually finished printing the UBSON report into the D message buffer. So we will stop at UBSON epilog. And at that point, we can really just you know, attach the debugger to it and read out the D message buffer. So I fire up GDBSX, attach it to the domain, go into the source folder where I compiled that kernel, load up the, the symbol file for the kernel, attach to the bridge, and print the D message buffer using LX D message. And there we go. Right at the bottom of the D message buffer, we see the report that UBSUN generated for the bug that the fuzzer just found. This is an array index out of bounds error in XHCI ring. Awesome. So this is pretty much how you triage the errors that you find uh, using the fuzzer. Um, for most of the cases, this has been perfectly sufficient, right? We have the source line um, that we have to take a look at. Usually it's pretty straightforward of where, where the bug is coming from, but uh, not, not all the time. Sometimes the bug triggers in code that's far away from the driver that we are actually fuzzing, right? So there is some call chain from the start point that we are fuzzing from that reaches some deep layer of the kernel. And that's where some bug happens, then figuring out what's going on there is, is a little bit more difficult. So let's look at triaging beyond the basics. Um, here is the harness that we use to fuzz the IGB network driver. So these are network drivers that receive packets and packets. Here we have an interrupt handler of when a packet is received by the kernel. And the kernel uh, goes and reads this Rx description buffer that the device places on the ring that has information about you know, what size of the packet that was just received is. So this is not the packet itself, this is metadata about the packet that the device itself constructs. 
and we want to fuzz that. So what we do is we jump in just after that Rx description buffer was received from the ring. We'll start fuzzing there, and we want to stop fuzzing when the loop loops around. Uh, we also have a harness stop when that loop uh, breaks out. That's not shown here. Um, so using this harness, we found the following bug. We get a Kassan null pointer dereference in a function called gro pool from frag zero. All right, we also get a helpful stack uh, call trace uh, where we see that, you know, there is Kassan report and just before that there is a mem copy. So gro pool from frag zero calls mem copy. All right, um, let's take a look at that function. It turns out that this is not in IGB itself. This is in net slash core slash dev dot C. So this is some deep layer of the Linux, you know, networking stack um, where it receives this SKB buff structure and does a mem copy from one place to another. We have no clue what those are, but this mem copy obviously trips a null pointer dereference. So it's either the source or the destination uh, is, is corrupt. Um, and it got corrupted because, you know, the fuzzer uh, found a way to corrupt it. Um, so at this point, the idea I had was, all right, let's take a look, you know, uh, which one of these pointers is uh, the culprit. Uh, we would want to stop the execution of a VM fork just at that mem copy. So we would be able to, you know, take a look at the state of the VM, the registers that contain those pointers to see which one is null. So we want to uh, stop the execution at that mem copy. The way we do this, um, it has a couple steps. Um, and we need a couple bits of information for it. Um, first of all, uh, we want to figure out you know, what is the address of Kassan report, because you know, that's, that's where we want to execute that VM up tail um, using single stepping. Uh, because just before Kassan report is reached, obviously we'll have the mem copy. So what we do is we just execute uh, the VM with that crashing input and we see that Kassan report is indeed tripped and we see the virtual address of that function, Kassan report where that is. Um, so we want to, at this point, create a VM fork, place that uh, buffer that we know that will trip Kassan report into that memory. So we will use this tool called rwmem, and we will write the contents of that file into the target buffer. And that will allow us to execute this VM to reach the, the crashing input and record uh, what happened. Obviously, we could use processor trace as well for it, but I found single stepping to be just as effective and it's a little uh, less convoluted. So now we have that VM fork set up with that crashing input injected into its memory. So now we just use the tool stepper that will use MTF single stepping to go all the way and stop at the virtual address of Cassandra report when that's reached. And we will pipe the output of that into a file. And if you take a look at what this file contains, so this is effectively just the disassembly of each instruction that I executed. And, you know, this reaches Kassan report at the end. So, you know, there is a ton of instructions in there. Um, just looking at that is not all that helpful for the task we are trying to do. But what we can take from that is really just take the instruction pointers that were observed and translate it using the kernel's debug symbols using address to line that will actually get us the source lines of what each of those instructions actually are. So now if we take a look at this decoded log, what we will see is that each instruction pointer and what you know, source line it corresponds to. So at the bottom of this file, we see immediately, all right, so that's where GRO pool from frag zero is, and there is the mem copy that trips the null pointer dereference. So I just take the last instruction that's still at the mem copy before Kassan report trips, and I want to re-execute that VM uh, to stop at that mem copy, at the last instruction in that mem copy, to be able to see you know, what the register state is. So again, I just create a fork. I use rwmem, same way as before, and just change the domain ID. And now I want to stop on this address, which is the mem copy's address. I don't actually need to save the output because I know where it's going. 
But now this domain ID 61 is paused at that mem copy, so I can just go and take a look at the register state, uh, take a look at the source pointer. RSI is the register that holds the, the source pointer in this case, and RDI holds the destination one. <clears throat> oh well, it kind of looks like um, both source and destination in that mem copy is a null pointer, so they are both corrupted. Um, so this uh, approach did not really yield us anything uh, that we could use to figure out what went wrong, since you know it looks like that entire SKB buffer is just bogus. Um, so uh, what else can we do? Well, the idea is that well, if we can't uh, figure out just at the mem copy what went wrong at the location where the bug trips, is we can compare the execution that goes to Kassan report with the execution that is normal. So we can take the normal input that was used as the seed, right? We know that this is the input that the kernel would have executed with uh, normally, and that does not cause a crash, right? We see that it reaches the harness signal on finish. So we will just create a fork from that use stepper to go all the way to the end harness, just as we did before. We'll stop on this address, save the output to a log file. Now we can take the instruction pointers from this log file, decode it using address to line, save that as well. And now we have the decoded log for both the execution that goes to Kassan report and that goes to the end harness, and we can just diff them. The very first line in this diff is going to be where the execution diverges from the normal one. And we have the source line. You can just go straight there, look at the code, and bam, this is the first line in this execution that only happens when the fuzzer with the input that the fuzzer found. So it turns out that you know, the SKB buffer is constructed by the driver and it's being passed to you know, those deeper layer kernel subsystems. But the way it gets constructed here is based on information that came from that Rx description buffer <clears throat> and it's bogus. Um, so obviously what needs to happen is that even if that Rx description buffer says that, oh, there is this you know, bit set, there needs to be a little bit more sanity checking in place before that SKB uh, structure is manipulated. So if you actually look at the latest kernel code, you will find that this code has been fixed and it's effectively was just missing a sanity check on data that was coming from, from DMA. All right, let's look at a couple more bugs just for fun. Uh, can you spot the bug here? How about this one? If you haven't noticed yet, but kind of the theme of these bugs is about the same. You get some DMA sourced input that is used without input validation and is just you know, used for whatever uh, the kernel decides. In this case, for example, this is used as the slot ID is derived from DMA memory and is used for an array index. Well, what can go wrong there, right? Um, so yeah, we found nine null pointer dereferences, three array index out of bounds. We found some infinite loops in the interrupt handlers, um, but also during boot, the kernel can trip with user memory access as well, which is you know, not great. Um, and these are all pretty much stem from the same problem in that the kernel does not treat DMA memory as a security boundary. Um, DMA memory is kind of treated trusted and consequently it means that all of these devices are treated trusted. And when you are talking about USB devices, well, it's not great that all USB devices are treated like that. Um, Another problem uh, case that we wanted to look at uh, is when these kernel codes might uh, perform double fetches. Um, double fetch 
is effectively a race condition where you can read you can have problems where you have time of check to time of use uh, where the kernel is performing even if it did perform some sanity checks on memory that's dma the problem would be that even if you do uh, sanity checks on dma accessible memory by the time you finish your your sanity checks that data might have you know changed underneath because the device has access to that same memory so if it wins the race you might finish security checks but the data is you know still corrupt uh, so obviously we wanted to detect if that happens and the idea was to okay let's remove EPT permission from DMA pages and just you know create a record of when DMA pages are being accessed and if it's you know if you get a page fault uh, where the kernel is reading some address from from DMA and it's the same page with the same offset twice in a row that's the strictest definition of a double fetch uh, we can detect that and report that as a crash to EFL, so we can go and take a look at the code to see, you know, whether the, the double fetch is a security concern. Um, we thought it would be rare, uh, but it turns out that it happens all over the place. Um, some kernel drivers treat DMA memory as, you know, uh, totally trusted, so they would just keep going back and fetching the same, you know, uh, memory left and right. Um, but so far, we haven't found a strictly speaking security issue because it turns out that you know the same byte is being fetched, but different bits are used from the, that byte. Um, so far, it hasn't looked dangerous, but obviously, this practice of just treating DMA memory is is bad, and it needs to change. But we've received considerable pushback from kernel maintainers um, for various reasons, performance, uh, regressions, uh, you know, fear of regressions. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, to you know, close this class of bugs, uh, DMA memory should really be treated the same way as user space memory is. Like every DMA memory should get copied into a local buffer before you know, being used by the kernel. And that's you know, absolutely not the case today. All right, so uh, we found a bunch of bugs, we fixed them, uh, mission accomplished, right? Um, not so fast. Um, as you recall, the way we found the DMA input points was just through, you know, reading the source code and doing some experiments with Ftrace, but there was this lingering feeling of like, hey, did we really discover all DMA input points? Like, uh, you know, what data do we have to back that argument? And I mean, we had a bunch of people look at the code so that gave us some confidence, but you know we couldn't put a number on it. Um, we also got bogged down by you know just documenting all the bugs we found, and you know at some point it just became non-productive to keep staring at the code because it was just annoying. Uh, so you know let's do better. Um, this tool called DMA Monitor uh, we added to the project um, to be a standalone EPT fault monitoring tool. So this effectively came after the double fetch detection code was added. And the idea is that, well, if we can already detect when DMA is being accessed for double fetches, well, we can use the same approach to detect when you know, DMA is being accessed at all, right? We can really just trace uh, who is accessing DMA and where by using EPT faults. The only thing we need is to know where the DMA pages are. Uh, fortunately, the Linux kernel has its you know, own internal DMA API that all kernel modules should be using to set up DMA uh, for devices. And in that, there is a function that is used to allocate memory to be used for DMA, DMA alloc attributes. Uh, we can hook that function uh, using a breakpoint through the hypervisor and hook the return address when the function finishes, and that will get us the virtual address of all pages that the kernel uses for DMA. And then we can just remove the EPT permission for all those pages on the fly, effectively giving us a way to log all the code sites that read from DMA as the kernel is running. So let's take a look at how this works in practice. Uh, I'm booting up a, the same VM. And on the right, I'm firing up DMA monitor. I just tell it you know, what is the, the domain and what is the debug JSON of that kernel is, DMA alloc attributes is hooked as the kernel is booting, and then we pretty much immediately start to see a ton of DMA accesses happening uh, as that kernel is still booting. Um, as you can see, there are 
quite a few pages allocated for DMA, and we can grab through that you know log and see when it's you know the access is just a read access. Uh, we can take the instruction pointer for each, sort through them, and just take the unique ones. Uh, there's still a ton of them, but uh, you know we can feed this through address to line to get a you know explicit list of all the places that the kernel touched DMA from. So you know this is quite a few places, but at least now we have an explicit list that we need to go through and take a look and see you know whether the data that is being read from DMA at these locations is complex enough to warrant fuzzing which is awesome. We didn't have to look at the source code to figure out where to start. So this is, you know, miles better than what we were doing before because we just, you know, have the list that we have to take a look at instead of having to keep, you know, parsing everything in the kernel to see whether that's DMA access or not. Um, there were some, still some corner cases uh, with the DMA monitor, either though it's way better than what we were doing before uh, and that's because some of the times the DMA access that the, the kernel is doing is just reading something from DMA and you know stashing it into some structure and returning, and then the kernel is going away and doing something else. So we are like, okay, well, where is that data going to get used after the DMA access? Nothing you know warranted fuzzing, but you know that that data is still sitting now in the kernel in private kernel memory, but it still can be potentially malicious. Um, so, you know, where is it getting used and is it safe? And we were like, well, we have no idea. Um, we didn't want to go back reading the source code because it's very hard to follow that uh, type of data, you know, life cycle in the kernel. And it's very error prone and it's very manual and annoying. Um, so that's where this next tool idea came from uh, that we call pool VM taint analysis. The goal is to really just track the tainted data propagation in the kernel. We know where the data is coming from, right? We have the source, that's the DMA access. So we want to taint that address and track, you know, what the kernel is doing with that data and where the data lands and when, you know, how it affects the execution of the kernel. Uh, we will use VM trace, uh, aka Intel processor trace to record the execution of the, of the kernel with very low overhead. And after some time, uh, replay that recorded instruction stream through the Triton DBI's taint engine. So that's a separate open source project that's really awesome that we integrate with. And that will tell us, you know, what instruction pointers get tainted by that data that we just, you know, read from DMA. And that will tell us, you know, all the locations where the control flow of the kernel depends on tainted data. So let's uh, take a look at this as well. Uh, here is a VM fork that I know will perform a DMA access at this, this page. So I will, you know, fire up DMA monitor on it, I unpause it, and yes, we see, you know, there is a single DMA access to that page where something was read out from the DMA and stored somewhere in the kernel. So we don't know, you know, at this point, like where, where else that data is getting used. So now the idea is to use VM taint to figure that out. We will use VMTain to save the state first. So this saves the stack and the resistors of the starting point into a file that we will need for the taint engine. We create another fork. We start the collection of the processor trace buffer. We pipe that into a file. And on pause, the VM fork. Now it's running and it's recording the execution into that, into that buffer. Uh, we let it run for a second or two. We pause it and we can start decoding that processor trace and feed it through the taint engine, pipe it into you know, the taint.log file and take a look while that is processing uh, what it found so far. So right off the bat, we see you know, where that uh, move copied the data, what register got tainted. And from there, you know, where else, what else got tainted during the execution of the kernel. And there we go. Right off the bat, we can see, you know, all the different instruction pointers that got tainted from just that single DMA access. And if you do this, you know, for the boot of the kernel, you can really 
check the full lifecycle of DMA source data through the execution of the kernel without even having to open up the source code of the kernel and just giving you right away all the locations that the control flow might depend on tainted data. You go take a look. If it you know, looks complex enough, you put a harness around it and you can start the fuzzer. So this code is released as well as everything else. Most of the code is upstream in Zen. Uh, but this code you can grab from GitHub. There are also a couple of goodies that I wanted to mention. Um, this is pretty new. Um, some of the uh, targets that we wanted to fuzz were kind of difficult to get working in a Zen VM. Um, so we came up with this way of being able to transplant uh, the state of uh, the system from one hypervisor to, to another. So in this case, you can take the take a snapshot on KMU, KVM, or Simix and load it up on Zen because VM forks really only need the CPU state and the memory of, uh, of your target to, uh, to be fuzzable. So uh, you can use all of those different hypervisors uh, to take a snapshot and load it up on Zen and fuzz away. Couple things we want to work on next or already are working on. Uh, top of the list is automation. Um, putting an end-to-end -end, you know, automated fuzzing system together is what everyone is asking about. So that's absolutely something we are looking at. Um, would be also pretty awesome to capture system state using Intel DCI, which is a USB 3 based debug connection that you can attach to a you know, bare metal system and capture the full system state. This would allow us to you know, really fuzz any code that runs on any system, including BIOS and SMM code. So this would be pretty cool. Um, another idea we have is uh, creating the SenseIfter Ring Zero mode tool, uh, adding nested virtualization support so we can fuzz hypervisors. Obviously, with Intel DCI, we would be able to capture you know, hypervisor state as well. So that might not necessarily be you know, a requirement, but you know, still would be cool to have. And a couple things I didn't cover in this talk that uh, you know are already possible using VM forking and all the tools that are available open source, like you know fuzzing other operating systems, fuzzing Zen, uh, user space binaries are absolutely something you can you know fuzz with this system, black box binaries, and you know even malware. So if you're looking for ideas, here's a couple things that are already possible. Uh, so thank you. That was uh, that was my talk. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, reach out. And you know, thanks goes to a whole bunch of people who made this work possible. So this was not uh, you know a single person's uh, job. This was you know large teams working on this. So thanks everyone for your involvement and absolutely for the open source community for releasing all the tools that uh, make you know rapid security development like this possible. So. Thanks. I hope you found you know some cool information in this talk. And uh, you know the goal here is to get you to go out and go fuzz the kernel because we found some bugs, but you can bet there are more to be found. So thank you. Looking forward to your questions.